Hi, I'm James McLean and I'm one of two fish curators at the Natural History Museum in London. As well as looking after our existing fish collection, which includes hundreds of thousands of specimens, some dating back to the 1760s, I'm also occasionally lucky enough to get to go out and make new collections as well. In 2019, three of us, myself, Jonathan Abbott and Kirsty Lloyd, were very happy to be invited on an expedition to the South Atlantic as part of the UK government's Bluebelt programme which was being organised by the British Antarctic Survey and CFAS. I would be processing fishes, John would be doing cephalopods, and Kirsty would be taking tissue samples. The Blue Belt programme aims to survey the marine environment around UK overseas territories, an area of over 4 million square kilometres, and to improve our scientific understanding so that areas of protection can be set up, particularly with regard to managing existing fisheries to make them as sustainable as possible. This particular expedition was going to look at Tristan de Kuna and St Helena, with a broad range of objectives for each territory. For Tristan, the survey looked at biodiversity and the habitats associated with the surrounding seamounts, the main area for demersal fishing. We were very happy to hear last year that a marine protected zone of nearly 700,000 square kilometres was set up around the area as a result of our trip. The St Helena leg focused on pelagic ecosystems with a view to improving our understanding of the food webs that underpin tuna fisheries around the island and Cardinal Seamount to the north. This shot from Google Earth will give you an idea of just how remote the islands are. One, the Falkland Islands, where the voyage began. Two, Tristan de Kuna, the world's most remote inhabited island apparently, home to around 250 people. And then, 1,500 miles away is St Helena, number three. The whole trip was well over 5,000 nautical miles and took around five weeks. Here's our ship, the Discovery, a very, dis a very comfortable vessel fully equipped with lab space, scientific equipment, a cold room for specimen preparation and even a cinema. This is the business end. This is where we lower the gear, a massive rectangular mouth trawl made up of two nets, each with a 25 meter square mouth that can open and close and demand. What we mostly did was lower everything to 1,000 metres and then trawl between there and 700 metres for about 40 minutes and then open the second net and do another trawl up to 400 metres. So each event would yield two samples. It looked a bit like this. This is a very small one made as a test in the open sea. And it got a bit bigger when we trawled around the more productive seamounts. This is a very common kind of midwater fish called a lanternfish. We got loads of these in our trawls. They're covered in tiny light, which you can see still glowing very faintly blue in this specimen. This genus Diaphus is distinctive for having two large headlights just in front of its eyes. A much more predatory fish, Sloan's viperfish, with fangs so big that they cannot fit into its mouth but slide up the front of its face instead. It also has lights along its body, but also a modified fin ray, which it uses as a lure to attract its prey. This is a sample from near St Helena where the waters are more productive so we got much more diverse samples. There are at least 40 species of fish here. More predators, a fang tooth and a selection of juvenile deep sea anglerfish which also use lures for catching their prey. This is one of my personal favourites, an incredibly rare anglerfish called a toothless sea devil. Only a handful of these have ever been caught and it is a complete mystery as to why they've lost their teeth. Nobody knew what they ate either, so it was very exciting to catch one with a full stomach. I'm currently investigating this using CT scanning. It's definitely consumed part of an eel, but there are other remains in there too, which I'm trying to identify. These were, uh, I think, the biggest and weirdest fish that we got, inflated whiptails. They're also very rare, and these two specimens now double the total number in the NHM collection. So all these specimens, nearly 3,500 lots in total, and their 2,000 tissue samples were all brought back to the NHM where we curated and databased them, and then made them available for any interesting science projects, which is where Alex comes in. Thanks, James. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm a PhD student at the Natural History Museum and at Royal Holloway University of London. I usually research plastic pollution in the River Thames in the UK, so this was a very exciting change to my routine. James provided me with a selection of species, including the Sloan viperfish and the inflated whiptail you've just seen. Overall, 32 fish were examined from 15 species. 
These were mostly mesopelagic species, but we also sampled two shallow water species for comparison. To recover the plastic, I firstly removed the digestive tract. In the top right image, you can see this black structure, which is the stomach of Opostomias. Any prey items in the digestive tract were removed, identified and analysed separately. This allows us to estimate contamination in the prey species as well. The digestive tract and prey items were digested overnight in a 10% solution of potassium hydroxide at 50 degrees C. This removes most of the organic material, making it easier to find the plastic. In the bottom image here, you can see that the solution is clear, with only a small amount of material which has settled to the bottom of the tube. This solution is then filtered, and that filter searched under a microscope. More mesopelagic fishes contained plastic in the digestive tract than shallow water species. We only had a small sample of shallow water species, just a couple of specimens, collected on the discovery expedition. So whilst we didn't find any evidence of contamination, it is still likely that shallow water species are also affected. Most of the plastic recovered was fibres, and you can see a couple of examples of those here. Two thirds of the mesopelagic specimens were contaminated with microplastic. For comparison, an average of 28% of Thames fish have plastic in the digestive tract, and worldwide, commonly about a third of fish are contaminated. Again, we only have a small sample size in this study, but from these specimens, it is clear that plastic penetrates to the deep ocean. We couldn't compare plastic ingestion between species due to our limited sample. Instead, we grouped fish based on their feeding behaviour. Predatory species ingested significantly more plastic than planktivorous fish and benthic feeders. This could be due to the trophic transfer of plastic from prey to predators. This is why we removed the prey items before digestion. Here you can see two fang tooth collected by James. The individual in the top image clearly has a full stomach. Indeed, when I dissected this individual, we found many intact prey items, likely the result of net feeding. Most notably, there is a cock-eyed squid, a sea devil, and a bolotinid octopus. Examinations of the prey revealed that both the squid and sea devil had ingested microplastics. If these prey items had been digested, the plastic would have been transferred to the fang tooth. The plastic recovered in the mesopelagic fishes were polyester and cellulosic fibres. The cellulosic fibres include cotton and a semi-synthetic material known as viscose. Viscose is a modified form of cellulose often used in sanitary pads and wipes as well as in textiles and synthetic silk. Many of these fibres likely originate from washing our clothes. An average wash can release 700,000 fibres. These exit the machine in wastewater and are transported to plants where they are filtered out even further. Many plants can successfully filter up to 99% of plastics in the wastewater. However, that 1% worldwide quickly adds up. Another source of plastic that these fibres could originate from is sewage-related debris. Things like sanitary pads and wet wipes, which will wash down the toilet. These can then fragment in the environment. We can stop this plastic entering the environment and being ingested by fish by implementing more filters in washing machines or in wastewater treatment plants, or perhaps designing clothes that shed less fibres. Sewage related debris could be stopped by people not flushing sanitary pads or wipes. Perhaps this means there needs to be better labelling on those products, or education as to the impacts of what happens when they are flushed. It's hard to isolate the exact source of plastics in the ocean. Models have demonstrated that microplastics released from South Africa can be transported to the South Atlantic. So plastic in the deep ocean could have come from many sources. That's all from us. We'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all the support we had in this project and we'd like to thank everyone for watching. Hi Alex and James, thanks so much for that and for coming to join us for this question and answer at the end of your talk. Um, I've got a few questions for you. Um, number one of course is um, do toothless sea levels, sea devils, actually really exist or did you make them up? 
No, no, that's the real name. They look like that. They, they have do. Photoshop to, or in... No, and it's so weird that they don't have any teeth because that's, that's one of the sort of defining features of anglerfish. They all have massive teeth, but this group just have lost them for some reason. And we're currently trying to work out why that might be. They're completely amazing. Um, so I've got a question from David L, which was, was there any decompression damage to fish bringing them up from those types of they're not too bad, actually, um, because they weren't coming up from such a deep depth um, and they were being brought up really slowly as well. They were actually in pretty good condition. In fact, some of them, including the fang tooth, uh, were still alive. And we actually had a fang tooth in a tank for a little while. It wasn't very happy, but it was alive for a little bit. Wow. Alex, one from you, um, from Graham Rao. Uh, did you conduct parallel extraction controls to ensure that the microplastic fibres were not the result of contamination? Yeah, so obviously airborne contamination fibers in the air around us are a huge uh, issue for microplastics research. But we have parallel digestion controls, so just KOH with no sampling, so we can record if there's any fibers in the lab, as well as a, a petri dish that measures anything that might have fallen on that sample while we're processing it. So all of the results are sort of with that accounted for. Fantastic. Um, and going back to archive collections, can we check older anglerfish stomachs on Simon Turner? I really hope so. It's something we'd like to do because we've got fish going back, you know, over 150 odd years and we've got a lot of deep sea stuff. We've got things from areas that we've subsequently sampled again. So it'd be really interesting to see what's happened over time. So that'd be a great thing to do with if Alice would like to. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to do it. So if we get the opportunity to, James and I are both more than willing to do it. So it's more just getting the time and the funding. Well, that brings me neatly on to my question was, uh, how do you feel about destructive sampling, James in particular? I mean, were these fish caught deliberately in the knowledge that they would be digested or did you have um, uh, accessioning problems or how did you go about it? So Alex doesn't destroy the whole fish. And she does a really nice job of just removing the guts. So when we get the specimen back, all it has is just a slit down into its belly. So the actual specimen is still mostly intact. And I think, in, we always say that if you can make a good enough case, if you get some really interesting, valuable information, you will consider some kind of destructive sampling. There are forms to fill in, but we do allow it in certain cases. And I thought this was such an interesting uh, project and it's so topical as well. I thought it, justified the what, what Alex was doing. Would you feel the same way about more historic collections? If yeah, I mean obviously you have to look at if something's very old, if, if it's the only example of the thing that we have, then all that has to be taken into account and your case for doing it has to be much, much better, yeah. Um, Alex, I was going to ask you, um, have you got any evidence that microplastics are actually detrimental to the fish? Are they lacking in condition or anything like that? Is there... so it's really hard to tell from these particular animals. So it's kind of the downside of doing a dissection like this is that you've only got a snapshot. So you see that that animal at that exact moment you pulled it up. So you don't have any idea of how long that plastic was retained in the stomach. It could have been there for days or weeks, or it could have been there a matter of minutes, which is probably the case with the fang tube. So the fang tube had uh, several identifiable, identifiable prey items in it, including a squid and an octopus and a small anglerfish. And we know that that was probably a case of net feeding because of just how well preserved those were. Um, so it was a case that it probably only just eaten them. And at least two of those prey items had plastic in themselves, which would obviously once digested be transferred to that fish. So we know in that case it looks quite healthy because its stomach's full so it's eating but that plastic was only in there you know mere moments before we got to it um, whereas if it's in there longer term or if it's larger plastic it can have more severe impacts. Certainly there's chemicals such as dyes in plastic which can be carcinogenic or can be endocrine disruptors um, but at present the sort of levels we're finding in the the environment tend to suggest it's sublethal effects rather than fatalities. So have you got any evidence that it transfers from the stomach into the rest of the fish? With uh, microplastics I don't think that's going to be an issue because it's far too large. There's obviously a risk that the chemicals associated with it can, whether that's the chemicals in the plastic itself 
or persistent organic pollutants that adhere to the plastic surface, which are then leached after ingested. Um, but those plastics can break down further in the environment and it's probably a risk more for nano uh, plastics. Um, that's not really an area that I'm particularly uh, well versed on, but I know that there are tests that are finding it can transfer to other tissues. It's just a case of the moment sort of getting rid of false positives in those tests. Um, one from the questions. Hi, for Alex, was there any relationship between parasitic and plastic, uh, sorry, yeah, parasitic and plastic burden? So we, uh, I didn't see any obvious parasite burdens. Um, I did do a test with a completely different sample from the River Thames actually during my master's. This was, oh goodness, four years ago. Um, but we didn't find any relationship. And again, I think that's because the plastic impacts maybe are quite small at the moment with the concentrations that we're seeing. And because we don't know how long they've been there, it's very hard to say whether parasite burden, you can't, you can't do it, there's no causality to it because of this snapshot of it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you could, I mean, you can't, I don't know if you can induce parasitism or in a, in a lab condition, but I wouldn't be surprised if the reduced health effects meant that it's very difficult for it to defend against those parasites. Um, again, a case where causality can't really be linked, but certainly in stranded mammals in the UK, autopsies often find that they've got very high parasite burdens and some of those are exposed to microplastics. But it's a question of, was it sick and had parasites and ate plastic or did it eat plastic and therefore got parasites? Um, and going back slightly, we've slightly covered this, but is there any evidence that microplastics are infiltrating fish muscles and or, and or other organs? What about microplastics on gills? So there are microplastics on the gills. I didn't look at the gills of uh, the deep sea fish, mostly because we wanted to keep them as intact as possible. But again, going to the Thames where I'm more often found, um, we do find plastic on the gills. Um, again, the microplastics probably too large to go into the tissues, um, but possibly a chemical burden is more likely. Um, and um, did you find anything else interesting on your expedition? I may have been prepped to say ask that question. Um, I think uh, the, the toothless sea devil was one of my favourites, but we didn't really realise that that was interesting until quite a lot later. So I brought that back and I thought it was a different kind of uh, anglerfish from the same family and I just had it down as Gigantactus and I put a picture of it online and then somebody said that might be ring cactus and then I checked it and it was and suddenly it became very, very interesting. Um, but also my other favourite one, there's a, um, a kind of fish called a, a spook fish and uh, it's got eyes that can rotate it has a sort of weird eye that's like a tube. It's in like, if you imagine a ping pong ball in the end of a toilet roll, that's what its eye is like. It's like a tube with a ball at the end. And in every specimen I've ever seen, the, the, the sort of the, the tube is pointing upwards. And lots of fish have eyes that are pointed upwards. They're looking for silhouettes of prey above them. But because this specimen was so fresh, we were sort of poking about at it. And we discovered that the whole eye mechanism rotates uh, 90 degrees, so it could sort of have its eyes pointing upwards when it's hunting. And then the whole thing points forward, so if it's swimming around, it can look ahead of it, and then when it stops, they go up again. And we had no idea that that happened. Um, and it was only because it was this lovely, fresh specimen, and you could see that, because as soon as you preserve it, that, that fixes in position. And that can you get two? Them. Can you preserve them in both? Oh, we, we only had one, but um, I'll remember that for next time, definitely. <laughs> or you can have one eye up and one eye up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was really cool to see that. And uh, that's been observed in another kind of fish, but it's never been observed in that one before. And it had been suspected they might be able to do that, and now we know that they can. So that was really cool. Cool. Um, I've got a question from someone called Kirsty Lloyd, who you may have heard of. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> James. Do you think, as a curator, being able to be involved in the whole process from specimen collection to research output is beneficial in terms of fostering links and, collabor and collaborations, especially for important topics like this? I think it's a great thing. And one of the two, because I've never seen that side of it before properly, really, because what normally happens for me is I'm at the museum and somebody just gives me a load of dead fish and then I process them. But to be there all the way through that stage, 
was fantastic. And, and it's also, it's so nice to be able to tell people about it, the interest that we got um, when we were on the boat, we were putting pictures of these things online. Everybody loves them. And it's such a great way to engage with people, to tell stories and to sort of get messages across like what Alex is doing. So it's, so, and if from the specimens, once they're at the museum, they just don't look as nice. And uh, I think uh, with the fresh material, it, it's, it's so much more, has so much more of an impact. And it's so great to be able to have photos of them fresh and be able to show people that side of the, the specimens as well. If that answers the question. I've got another question from someone called Rebecca Machine or Machin. Um, were you able to link up to any researchers or students on the Tristan de Kuna or St Helena? Did you do any projects with them? Um, we had some researchers that we dropped off there. So it was like there were loads and loads of different things going on on that boat. They were just making the, the, the most of that time. So there were people scanning the seabed, there were people looking for whales. Um, and there, were some, there was one researcher who was looking at seals that we dropped off on Tristan de Kuna. And they spent a week there um, while we were off doing the sampling. So there was that going on. And there were some other people there who were sort of talking to the local fishermen with regard to setting up that um, uh, sort of safe zone around the place. So there was lots of different things going on. So there were, we had loads and loads of different kinds of researchers on the vessel. Right. Um, Someone called Amanda Sutherland would like to ask, for Alex, how is cotton included as a potential source of microplastics? Was it simply listed because cotton fibres were recovered? So it's very difficult to distinguish different types of cellulose fibres. So whether that's cotton or viscose, it's hard to tell whether it's completely organic or semi-synthetic. I think the biggest issue is that we haven't recorded them usually. So until a few years ago, if we, well, cellulose is organic, cotton is organic, I'm not going to tell you that they were there and not record them. So we don't have any historical evidence of these fibres, but now we're finding that in most cases 70-80% of a sample will be these cellulose fibres, so a mix of maybe semi-synthetic and organic fibres. And we know that potentially there's evidence fibres have more of a negative impact than say microbes. So it could be the, merely the shape of that uh, fiber has an impact on the animal but also if they are from anthropogenic origins they will have dyes in them and other chemicals which are as I said uh, harmful to the organism so even though they probably are less uh, damaging than microplastics and certainly um, studies have shown that like a cell which is another um, similar to viscose it's another semi-synthetic it will have detrimental effects on animals that ingest it that is significantly less than what you'd find in polypropylene or polyethylene, for instance. So it's a case of we need to know that it's there so that we can sort of work out what effect it has and not monitoring that environmental level means that when people come to do lab studies, we have a concentration that we can say, that's in the environment, that's a reasonable concentration to test. Whereas all of the early studies of the plastic ingestion were essentially, if I fill a tank, plastic let's see what happens and unsurprisingly it often resulted in lethal uh, effects whereas people now look back at it and go goodness that's like a hundred times what you find in the environment of course it was lethal what does it do with the actual concentration so it's a case of reporting it being there so that when we come to do those studies that that evidence and that data is available what would be really interesting to see is if we do go ahead and do some sort of time series is to see what happens over time because you would think initially you you get more cotton fibers and obviously there's going to be a huge spike when people all get washing machines because that's such a huge source of all these fibers and then you think later on the plastic ones would start to appear so that would be really interesting yeah i mean certainly in if you take a sediment core from a, a lake or an estuary you can see when plastic started to come in like the diversity changes the polymers change and I think they took a somebody took a sample from a, a bathing lake, and you could see when uh, swimming costumes changed because suddenly you know it was fluorescent uh, 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 fibers when it was in fashion, and then suddenly oh fluorescent fibers aren't fashionable anymore, and so they disappear from the record. So it'd be interesting to see if you can get a sort of a fashion trend in the fish. Oh well, that's a 
bring, bring us perfectly full circle to Simon's talk at the beginning of the day. So can I thank you very much, both of you, for your time, for uh, doing the talk in the first place, but also coming to talk to us now. I really appreciate it. We all do.